Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Planning Commission podcast. Today's episode, Taking It to the Streets with Kia Wilson, Senior Editor with Streets Blog USA. The Planning Commission podcast is a spirited discussion with myself and a couple of my longtime colleagues in the profession. Our discussions are based solely on our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions or views of our employers, the American Planning Association, or even our alma maters. So grab a seat in the back of City Hall, dig out an old copy of Robert's Rules, and for goodness sakes, read your packet. The Planning Commission is now in session. All right, commissioners, let's start with a little bit of a roll call. Commissioner Smith? Here. And Commissioner Kostelik. Present. And I think that's like the third Doobie Brothers reference I've had in some form oh this week. So it comes in bunches. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is indicative of our age that the Doobies are now resonating with us, apparently. You know, it's generational. So <laughs> thank you, Doobies. So, all right. And I'm here. Let's get rolling. Our agenda today is going to be our discussion item whiskey pairing, the interview, and our lightning round. Uh, reminder to all of our listeners, first, thanks for listening and tuning in. But if you do us a favor, head to the website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. Go to YouTube, go to Amazon, Apple, Spotify. We're there to listen or watch, um, but hit us back, man. Email us, tell us what you think about the show. Give us some ideas. We love your feedback. We we try to listen to them and, and, and appreciate all the kind comments. I don't think we've got any negative ones just yet. Maybe that mustache. I don't know. What do you think, Don? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that was just me. Probably yelling, positive. <laughs> no, no, no. Mustache is so on trend. You know they're all positive. He is a I'm trendsetter. Look at him. I mean, Look at come it. on. Right? Look at so, it. There you go. All right. <laughs> Let's start Ooh. with a discussion. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk all about street Streets Blog and, man, all the amazing work that they do of shedding light on all the different things with regard to walking, biking, transit, and across the country. But I want to ask you, have you ever single-handedly been responsible for making a street safer in some way? Yes. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Wow. Instantly. <laughs> well, touchdown. Holy I fun. mean, sports I, ball. Listen, listen, sports, <laughs> yes, touchdown. You know what? I don't listen. You said single-handedly. Listen. Mm, listen, Linda, I don't know if it was single-handedly, but I do know. I do know that I, I was working on this project and. I'm having a lot of fun um, being back in Alaska because I'm seeing projects that I helped work on and design and they're built now. And I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah, um, right. One of the things I'm thinking about is we never had one of these. And in I, I live in Anchorage. And at the time I was, I was living in Anchorage when I was working on this project. And it was, uh, it's, it's, we have something called the park strip in downtown Anchorage. And it's a, uh, <laughs> it used to be a runway for an airplane, um, but it's now it's just grass and people play Quidditch on it. I am don't oh, understand gosh. that oh, it's wow. a thing yeah. yeah they also do yeah. listen they also do like you know saturday morning um yoga in the park and stuff like that but the quidditch one is my favorite to just look at and be like wow they also do there's a <laughs> there's a place where it turns into an ice skating rink in the winter time but in the summertime they play bike polo i mean it's just kind of a cool um community have the doobie space. brothers done a concert on the gosh i hope so oh. you know I uh, those alimony seen... <laughs> payments are kicking in about now man i mean i've seen i've seen festivals like the, the the pride festival happens on this park and that kind of thing but i don't know i and and like that's where the um you know when they have big runs like half marathons and stuff they all kind of circle around this thing or whatever but anyway the whole the whole point is is that that on the one side of the strip is night and the other side is 10th and on 10th is a lot of parking. And what happened was, um, you know, we, we were working on a project, I think for the Muni there. And we were looking at that, that street and they were like, what can we do to make this, you know, better and safer? And I am this little, you know, maybe, I don't know, six years or something at a school. And I wasn't, I wasn't even really the planner on the project. There was no planner on the project. It was an engineering design project. And they said, we need you to do the public involvement, right? And I said, um, well, 
what are you guys going to do to make this safe? But they're like, well, we're going to make it a bike boulevard, which was, mm. um, they, there's not really a bike boulevard. It was still going to be have plenty of cars on it because we had We're going to bring out lots of paint and signs and call it something <laughs> it isn't. I know. And, and so I said, I don't, you know, and I kind of just, I was like, okay, I don't know if this is a bike boulevard, but I said, well, the one thing that we could do is we could do back in parking because yeah because everything was pool and parking and um and so they did and it was really cool because what i got to do as the public involvement person is i got to make all these cool like uh, uh, drawings and stuff that that showed why back in parking was kind of intuitively a yeah. better thing and yeah. let me tell you the mamas the mamas loved it because the mamas were like yeah my kids i get parked and they're undoing yeah, their yeah, seat right, belts, they're right. open their door and they're out and, and they didn't want them walking into the street and so what yeah, it did is when you yeah. open your doors, if, if you don't know about back in parking, you open the doors and, and it kind of pushes um, you towards um, wherever you're, you'd really like people to go. And, and in this case, it's the park strip. So, so you helped to make back in angled parking at the... Yeah. Sure, you brought, it, brought have, it to Alaska. Listen, it's a tragedy though. I think that they reversed it while I was gone. I, yeah. I leave, I leave her four years and they change things. <laughs> I, I was in know. a library yeah. a few weeks ago in a city where we were working and they have a historic picture of downtown and like 1920s oh, yeah. Model A's parked there Ooh. back in angle parking. And I'm like <gasps> telling the city folks, I'm like, so if they ever say, oh, we can't do this, just pull that foam core picture out and, and yeah. show them. I think for mine, not only single handed, but I would also say heavy handed. Um, so if you know me, Ooh. that's uh, <laughs> probably pretty typical. Um, and imagine it was with my favorite agency, the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's everybody's they, favorite. They love you. They're they're they, very fond listen, of you. Yeah. Listen, they yeah, don't like that, me either. <laughs> that, <laughs> that red that red dot on the phone starts going off when I start getting near. So <laughs> they they have the punch under like the emergency, the panic button under the desk when yeah, you walk in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised I haven't been Jimmy Hoffett by one of their contractors yet. So <laughs> Um, anyway, they were, they were building of all things, a sidewalk, which they rarely do. So let's honor them for the miracle that that was, but it was clear to anyone who's ever taken a 20 minute webinar on ADA compliance that that wasn't it. And knowing who the division engineer at NCDOT was at the time, I knew I had to be heavy handed. So this was a guy who, when a bicyclist was killed on a state route uh, in Asheville, the local advocates went out and put up a ghost bike. And it happened to be on his drive home, which just made him lose his you-know-what every day. And he had it removed. And so the advocates went out and they uh, basically dropped concrete in the ground and mounted the ghost bike <laughs> in that to oh make it gosh. worse for it. So that's oh who we gosh. were. That's what we had to do to get an effect. So I got uh, a wheelchair and a GoPro and I got all the bidding documents and everything else. And I hooked up the wheelchair to the GoPro. I sat in it with the bidding documents in my lap and rode through that to show that how it would pitch a person in a wheelchair toward the street and held up in front of that camera the stamp engineering drawings so oh, they man. couldn't wiggle their way out of it. And um, sadly, I think any public meeting input, any email would not have, they'd have just mm -hmm. flicked it off the shoulder like DOTs tend to do the public. Yeah. And so I had to make that statement. And of course, the heavy handed, I, like me, I CC'd everybody and their brother on it to make it known. So well, that's my video. Yeah, that's great. And and video is so powerful, right? I mean, oh, yeah. and, uh, how do you deny what you're seeing in front of you? It's, it's pretty tough to do that. And you're right. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, that's something in our industry, we ask people to participate and give us their opinions. And often it's, you know, it's a vocal or maybe written on some form. And it's like, unfortunately, a lot of folks disregard that. And like, let's be real. Like we, they, yeah. we need to have more effective ways at public participation. I think we're getting that way with people uploading images or even taking videos at time, video voice, all those mm -hmm. kind of things. And I think that's a much needed improvement in that realm. So what have I done? Um, you know, aside from, I'm going to take it on a personal note, other than the professional, the professional, it's always fun. Um, I, one of the, my favorite things, speaking of Quidditch is to, 
you know, do demonstration projects with spray chalk. Oh my gosh, that's just the best spray chalk can of it go out. Next thing you know, you're a magician, man, because all the traffic changes and goes different directions. I love doing that. It's fun. But right in front of my dang house, just about my, you know, kind of a busier street, um, our little art, kind of an arterial roadway that separates my neighborhood from uh, a park setting and pathway kind of a thing. And one of my daughter, my first oldest daughter was born. It quickly hit me that, whoa, this is more challenging to cross than I realized. And, you know, so what did I do? Did what just what Don just described, started a public campaign, started taking video from a distance and watching pedestrians try to cross the street and dodging and no one stopping for them. And it was one after another and going, it's needed because I asked repeatedly, can we get something here? And it didn't happen, didn't happen. So then I got my daughters out there and we sat on the corner and started collecting signatures. We started collecting signatures. We started collecting more video and getting people's positive responses and just started hitting social media. And all we were asking for was a rapid flash beacon and a paint job, you know, really. Um, I, knowing the agency like I did, I knew there wasn't going to be much more that they were going to do beyond that. But I was okay with that. At least it was, you know, two lane road. It was you know, sort of appropriate that way. Um, and lo and behold, man, it worked. And I'd say maybe six months after we started our our effort and earnest, it, it got put in. And now my girls give me kind of grief yet in pride because, you know, every time we pass by that, they're just like, look what we got done. And it's pretty awesome. And it has made a marked difference with people trying to, to cross that street. People do comply with it quite a bit. And so fun time, fun story. Um, but let's turn our attention to the whiskey pairing um, and and get done, Commissioner Kostelik's opinion on how we can pair a wonderful, delicious drink of whiskey with taking it to the streets. Well, I think with today's topic and our guest, uh, Kia Wilson from Streets Blog, I wanted something that wasn't watered down because they do not water things down. And everything in journalism is about, you know, new and and keeping it real. Things don't uh, sit on the shelf for very long. So I'm going to go with, I guess, somewhat of a family tradition with some good old uh, corn liquor, straight up moonshine. There you go. Uh, from some unnamed in-laws. And uh, again, it's it's not watered down. It's not aged. It's not old. And if you know good moonshine, it's about how well it beads, how well it beads up. And that's how they tell. And and I said to say this one doesn't have great beads to it, but uh, it's pretty potent. Uh, <laughs> Can it take paint off a chair? <laughs> it, it will. It was great hand sanitizer at the beginning of COVID as well. Perfect. I like it. Don't nothing diluted straight to the point packs a punch, right? Which is exactly what uh, streets blog USA has been doing for quite some time. So perfect, perfect pairing. Thank you, Commissioner Kosalik. We would like to take a quick moment to thank our friends at Plan Edison for supporting today's podcast. Looking to sharpen your urban planning skills and advance your planning career? Plan Edison courses offer 300 courses on cutting edge planning topics and skills, such as parking reform, missing middle housing, equity analysis, and climate resilience. Visit courses.planedison.com forward slash PC10 to take advantage of an exclusive offer for Planning Commission podcast listeners. All right, let's turn to our interview. Kia Wilson, Senior Editor with Streets Blog USA. Thanks for joining the Planning Commission podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Well, if you wouldn't mind, let's start off with a little bit about you, your career path, what took you to your current position. And then at some point, we want to ask you the same question about ways that you've maybe uh, changed and, and made a mark on local streets in your neighborhood. But let's start with a little bit about who you are. Yeah. Um, so I guess who I am today, I write for, as mentioned, Streets Blog USA. We bill ourselves as an advocacy journalism outfit covering the movement to end car dependence in the United States. That's that's at least how I describe it. Um, and yeah, USA is the sort of umbrella. Well, we're not an umbrella organization, but we are covering all the cities that our affiliate sites are not covering, as well as federal policy that affects them all. Um, it might be scandalous to some people to know that I came at this career not as someone with any training in the built environment 
at all in any way. I'm mostly coming at it as a storyteller. I uh, got my undergrad at a really wonky, weird little liberal arts school called St. John's College, where I studied a great books program. A lot of is ancient- that the one in Annapolis? Yeah, there is one oh. in Annapolis, and there's also one in Santa Fe. They are they are sisters. Oh, okay. All right. I went a to both of them. Of mine in graduate school went to the one in Annapolis, so that's oh, cool. Of- yeah, I I also went to the one in Annapolis for two out of the four years, and Santa Fe for the other two. Um, yeah, it's a, a weird school where basically you're studying like ancient Greek and like political philosophy and like all kinds of manner of like Kant and things like that, and it kind of got me interested in questions of like why not just cities but why everything is the way that it is and during this time i got really into riding my bike um i spent a lot of time at a bike co-op in santa fe called chain breaker collective that i loved really passionately spending a lot of time on bike stands next to you know unhoused folks for whom mobility was like a lifeline and having a bike was a complete life changer and it got me involved in advocacy a little bit um went on to get a master of fine arts and fiction writing i'm a novelist as well uh at washu in st louis and fell very deeply in love with st louis i'm from the rust belt in the midwest originally and it was kind of a homecoming and the cities felt fit me really well um and Yeah, I ended up working through a blind interview process at an organization called Strong Towns, which I think probably a lot of y'all know, and a lot of, I know Don knows, that's how I met Don, Um, and a lot of your listeners probably knows, which is a media organization uh, kind of talking about how to make cities financially strong and prosperous. I got a lot of my like urban economics sort of curiosity out of there and eventually ended up at Streets Blog. So yeah, I would say I am a storyteller first, advocate second expert of nothing, but a really curious (laughs) person who's interested in just making all this wonky stuff that I get really excited about, like angled and parking um, and things like that, feel as emotional and urgent and big of a deal as it actually is for the future and present of our planet. Um, So yeah, that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Did they discuss walkability in ancient Greece when you were studying those (laughs) philosophies? I, they sure do. <laughs> I don't want to bore the hell out of everyone. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of thought about like ideal urban form <laughs> and uh, how it facilitates the political process. So, but yeah, that I could write a dissertation for you, and we don't have all day. So, oh. <laughs> so what's I a project mean- you've influenced? <laughs> A project I've influenced. Um, well, that's a really weird question for me. <laughs> Someone who hasn't like directly been in this space, but you know, I liked Chris's answer about tactical urbanism. I've done, I've dabbled a little bit. I don't know how much of it I should confess to on tape because it's not all super legal, but, um, yes. you know, I, I am a prodigious reporter of broken sidewalks through the citizen service bureau of St. Louis. Um, <laughs> not amazing. as, yeah, yeah, not, not as prodigious as my husband, um, who who is a really lovely guy who uh, has gotten so into calling what we call CSB around here in St. Louis that he's like got like names for his various like guerrilla campaigns. So his favorite <laughs> one is um, he calls it tree pranking, which is he will submit a request for a street tree on behalf of a property owner, whether or not they want it um, to the city. He'll look up their name on like public tax records and their address and we'll get the city to put it in. And then we on our walks will go around and water all these trees because they didn't ask for them. <laughs> we did. <laughs> um, so okay. we, we're good. I think we have a future way. guest. Yeah. He's the good for the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know. Oh my gosh. So, Hey, so I'm thinking about, uh, so our listeners, we, we know that we have some listeners that are a little bit, um, you know, early in their experience as planners. And we love to talk to folks like you who have these cool resources. So a streets blog, can you tell us, um, just a little bit about streets blog, what it is and maybe how it was founded, just anything cool you want to tell us about it? Like why would a, I mean, I, I think that a lot of times we have people uh, that are listening to us that are these total nerds, right? They're these total planner nerds. So they're just going to go look at whatever we're talking about. But like, why check out Streets Blog? What do you think's going to gonna happen for them there? Yeah, um, hopefully a lot of things because I'm trying my best every day <laughs> to make it as actionable and exciting for folks as possible. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the very short history is Streets Blog 
Mothership, the, the brand Streets <laughs> Blog, was founded in 2006, back when the word blog was a word that people used in regular conversation, um, <laughs> by a guy named Aaron Napperstack, who if you listen to other podcasts in this space, you probably listen to The War on Cars. That's what yep. he's hosting these days. It's what a fabulous a name. resource. Love. What a oh, name. Can we just give a moment it's incredible. for the Napperstack name? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> incredible. Exactly. Aaron Napperstack, what a guy. Um, yeah. So to 2006 was when it was born. Um, it quickly spawned various little like affiliate sites throughout the country, which, um, by the way, all have their own separate boards and missions, which a lot of people don't know. I'm not like the Ooh. boss of all these other streets blogs. Oh, that's I'm cool. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of awesome, <laughs> honestly. Um, so Streets Blog USA was started, um, I believe, to cover the formation of like Map 21, if memory serves, the um, wow. infrastructure law. And that's not wonky at all. That's <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, so we have the bipartisan infrastructure law right now, which is in the news a lot. This was the past history times version of that basically but um since then has become like we we try to be just like a nerve center of interesting news happenings cool ideas controversies things going on in the movement to make cities less car dependent in the united states and a little bit in canada every once in a while i dabble over the border <laughs> so um yeah i think for me streets blog was really important to me as someone who as a novice was getting into this stuff and developing an armchair fascination with it um, we sort of start from the premise that we think that this stuff is for everybody. It affects everybody. You shouldn't need to have a degree to engage with it um, on a yeah. higher level, basically, because it's our lives. It's how we live. And we all have a voice in this conversation. So it's trying to fill a niche between the professionals and like the, the totally clueless. And I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about mm. the clueless as we talk about trends right now, because oh. <laughs> it's a very weird moment moment to be on this beat in the United States, let me tell you. Um, but yeah, we, we are uh, doing, I'm writing four to five articles a week and then syndicating many more. That's pretty much my whole job. We don't have a staff at USA. I'm always relying on uh, submissions from readers, on tips from readers. Please email me if there's something exciting and cool or scary and awful going on in your town that you think the world needs to know about when it comes to uh how people get around their cities and how that affects the way that they can participate in them listen be careful new... what you ask for i'm sorry i just say be careful yeah. what you ask for so you said email you tips where can we email you Kira? yeah um it is my name which is spelled like the swedish furniture store not the korean car it's k-e-a at streetsblog.org and streets is plural so let's get that out awesome of Kia so you... at streetsblog.org do it yep. yeah <laughs> So you mentioned the bipartisan infrastructure bill. You also hinted to just what a time to be covering this beat. What's happening in that world? Maybe focus on safety and equity to start with, which I think it all centers around. Yeah, I mean, the big stories, at least for me, that rest the surface today, it's my beat is huge. My beat is like the entire planet, basically, and like everything <laughs> and, about the way Canada. that we live. And, well, you in US and Canada, but yeah, my, my beat is a whole encompasses all kinds of facets of urban life. But the, the big stories that I made notes of before this conversation are things like the emergence of the National Roadway Safety Strategy. So um, going on about two years ago, we uh, got this document in Washington called the National Roadway Safety Strategy. It is the first time in US history that a sitting transportation secretary has said that the only correct number of people to die on US roads is zero, um, and that we can get to that zero, that non-binding commitment of zero, let's be clear, um, through a systemic approach, which is not trying to arrest every bad driver on the road and hope that solves it, but by addressing road design, addressing vehicle design, addressing the systems that constitute our transportation system. And we're seeing in practice, slowly in real time, what that means and what it can mean within our larger transportation program. So as you mentioned, Don, uh, same, around the same time, we got the bipartisan infrastructure law. Every four to seven years, I should say, uh, we get a new transportation reauthorization is what we call it, a big transportation transportation package in Washington that says, this is how much money we're going to give for all these various programs. Maybe we'll create a new, few new ones. Maybe we'll take a few away. And the one that we got um, recently was the bipartisan infrastructure law, which contains some interesting new programs specifically around 
things like the reconnecting communities program, trying to address the effects of highways um, on communities of color proportionately, um, disproportionately and low income communities, trying to mitigate the damage that past infrastructure investments have caused on vulnerable communities, while at the same time funding a lot of projects that in my opinion and the opinions of the advocates that I cover <laughs> are making it all worse simultaneously. Um, Transportation for America, which is an advocacy group I talk to a lot and oh, really yeah. recommend that you all follow if you don't already. Um, has this great cartoon, which is basically a backhoe shoveling out a hole and then someone else with a little teaspoon that says reconnecting communities pouring dirt mm. back into it. And that's kind of where we're at in a lot of ways. Um, the, the other things that I'm covering a lot lately are culture wars around mm. this stuff that we say it's wonky, we say it's nerdy, is now becoming the stuff of conspiracy theories. A uh, sidewalk is all of a sudden woke, right? It's like <laughs> that, yeah, like asphalt high ways are woke, you know, tearing down oh my a, gosh. Woke. <laughs> a story that you're probably seeing a lot. If you cover this, if you follow this stuff at all is like how the 15 minute city concept has been sort oh, of yeah. co-opted. Oh, yeah. Like oh, yeah. Whew. Yeah. Um, I hear a lot of stuff about like things like that at a community scale as well. Um, and the ways that formerly considered boring urban planning concepts are being kind of weaponized for fights that they have nothing to do with, or if they have something to do with it, they have a positive effect, generally speaking. So those are the three threads that sort of rise to the surface for me today. But again, it's a big beat. I write a lot. So uh, you will find much more than that on Streets Blog. So man, a lot to unpack there. Um, next week, we're actually interviewing a woman named Amy Stelly, who is, oh, uh, like you know, Amy, oh. yeah, so she's been an advocate for tearing down an interstate section in New Orleans. And as she herself is the a third generation, I think her, her kids are fourth generation residents, and she's seen firsthand, you know, what that has meant for their family and, and all of the different ways that you would think. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's coming up fast. It's quite amazing. Um, and then 15 minute cities. Yeah. Oh my gosh. The, the conspiracy theories of it is just, it's another topic that we've been kicking around. In fact, we, I spoke with the gentleman who's, you, whose clip has kind of made it around, you know, the country with respect to him being up in Canada and, um, man, that's a whole other story unto itself, but hard to believe that, that, we're turning in a, into a, a culture that's suggesting that if the grocery store is a five, 10 minute walk away, somehow that is way too much and some sort of a master plan, you know, way to ruin our lives. Like, like Don wants to jump in here. Oh, it's just like you take any community in this country of less than 10,000 people and go, guess what? You're, ten, you're, yeah. you're a 15 minute city. Yeah, and here where we are in Idaho. It's like, <laughs> you've all been that way for a hundred years. Oh my God. The conspiracy is that yeah. fast. It must be. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question I, and kind of going back to what you said, I, it's like, it seems to me, and I'd love your, your thought, you're much closer to the pulse of things. And then we are the new secretary of transportation, the new bill, it seems like there are a lot of things in it that are positive And I think going in directions that a lot of us in the industry would like to see and know needs to be done. And at the same time, you, like you mentioned, you know, some of these expansion projects where you're taking out neighborhoods and yet here comes the, you know, the environmental document saying finding of no significant impact and you're going, how is this possible, right? So I guess I, the question though is we'll we'll tread in the positive waters out of that bill, you know what are you seeing already that might be working and maybe we need more of and maybe some specifics that if you can share. Yeah. Um, so the positives of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Okay. Uh, so a few <laughs> things come to mind. Um, I think probably the single most positive thing about the BIL, I, I'm going to call it the BIL if that's okay. I try to avoid acronyms unless I'm like very specific about what they are, but um, is how much it gives in the way of discretionary grant funding to Pete Buttigieg and his colleagues. I think that's something that's really exciting. So there are two kinds of federal transportation grants, generally formula grants, which are allocated based on population and other factors um, based on a formula and discretionary grants, which is where smart people, hopefully smart people can get in there and uh, start making really interesting choices about 
based on the applications that they get. And there's a whole lot of money in the BIL for discretionary programs. I mentioned the Reconnecting Communities Act. That is a really small program. I, I believe it's uh, 1 billion across five years or 5 billion. I'm, I'm getting my numbers mixed up at the top of my head, but um, between the bipartisan infrastructure law and also the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a whole lot of money for Secretary Pete and um, his colleagues to do some really cool things. And generally, by and large, they are. Some, some bad projects will filter in every once in a while, but mostly they're making good choices that advocates are celebrating and I'm happy to celebrate with them. Um, on the less, can I pivot to negative? Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Do it. <laughs> Happens um, all the time. <laughs> yeah. On the less negative side, um, one of the biggest priorities of the advocates that I cover in the reauthorization process was to get what they call right to repair, or um, excuse me, fix it first laws. I'm getting my policy platforms mixed up today. Uh, so we have so many miles of highway throughout the United States that, you know, if you have listened to a politician speak ever, we have crumbling roads and bridges that we cannot seem to find the money to fix. And yet, when we dole out basically a block grant program, I think it's $110 billion in unrestricted highway funds under the bipartisan infrastructure law, suddenly all that money seems to need to go towards brand new highways, towards widening highways, towards adding lane miles that we already can't repair with the money that we have coming in from fuel taxes and things like that. Um, there was a huge, incredible bill in the House that would have required states to fix it first, and that was stripped out of the law ultimately, and that's mm. a really, really huge bummer, basically. Mm. Um, yeah, th there are a lot of fantastic new safety programs in this bill, things like the Safe, Safe Streets for All grant, I should also mention in the, the positive column, um, but they're really dwarfed by the unrestricted highway fund dollars that mm -hmm. we have going out. Um, I will also say sort of on the negative note, there was not in my opinion and in the opinion of a lot of folks that I talk to enough in there to address vehicle safety. So why we have pedestrian deaths going up in this country, pedestrian deaths have increased like 40% over the past 15 years while vehicle deaths have not. <laughs> and yeah. that's a really big problem. Um, a big factor in that is that the average vehicle on us roads has gotten substantially larger. We call it the mega car crisis. That's our like spicy mm -hmm. word for this particular <laughs> slice of the safety problem in streets slug. Um, and that's largely due to the fact that SUVs and pickup trucks, a category of vehicle class we call light trucks, um, are exempted from certain federal fuel standards or calculated differently when automakers have a lot of them in their portfolio. So now, surprise, uh, very few U.S. automakers are even selling cars that are sedans <laughs> that are that are yeah. properly cars. Um, and there's a lot of literature about why, but they're like SUVs and pickups are more fatal to pedestrians when they are hit, and they're also more likely to be hit in the first place because they have large blind spots, not just are in the front of the vehicle, but around the A pillars. You know, like those things on either side mm -hmm. of the windshield. Um, people are getting killed at, especially children. <laughs> at increasingly high rates. And they could have done a lot within the, the BIL to come like get, uh, Congress could have required the NISA to take more action on this than they did. They do, are requiring them for the first time to measure pedestrian safety, but the way that NISA seems to be wanting to implement that right now is to test like pedestrian automatic emergency braking systems rather than <laughs> mandating that cars just get smaller. Um, for me, I thought that was a huge missed opportunity. And so. I, it, I get it too. It's like, well, we regulate vehicles for safety. And I'm like, no, when you peel it away in this country, we really don't. We talk about occupant safety, but beyond mm -hmm. that, it, it it's a uh, it's a unfortunately a bloodbath on yeah. our streets out there. Yeah. I, I something else I see is um, my frustration with the bill. I mean, we live in a state here in Idaho where, quite frankly, our state DOT doesn't want to deal with non motorized users, um, and I don't see any willingness of FHWA even coming down at the state level offices to demand things like filling the sidewalk gaps on an existing state highway in a metro area before you mm -hmm. widen another one that that to me is a very basic policy thing if safety is truly our top priority and we just mm -hmm. can't get there do you hear that same frustration in other states of like just this disconnect between say what the secretary says and what fhwa actually requires states to do 
Oh, definitely. I mean, th- this has been a big fight, especially over the past year, um, culminating, culminating actually in the last couple of months. Um, so FHWA, to their credit, uh, put out a really interesting memo about a year and a half ago saying basically that states do have to prioritize safety. They do have to fix it first, that when they get these buckets of billions of dollars of unrestricted highway dollars, they're going to have to submit those projects up the chain to their regional FHWA office, and they're going to be facing a little bit more scrutiny. Just a heads up, we're encouraging you, but not requiring you to use this money, which is previously a free for all in a little bit more of a responsible way. It was a pretty gentle memo uh, and it caused a freak out among the GOP basically, and eventually ended up (laughs) with a government accountability office investigation. The memo was rescinded in January. um, And we're just starting to hear environmental groups like take notice of this and be like, hold on, wait, like this was such a gentle memo. It was just saying like, okay, please, if you can, we would like to, like, we're gonna ask you some more questions about these really toxic projects. And it was like slammed as government overreach and things like that. Um, We're also seeing in conversations like Houston had a really big, uh, dust up recently around the what they call the North Houston Highway Improvement Project. Which Ooh, is, yeah. It's funny yeah. how every Just time we say improvement, it's good. Yeah, 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 we mean widening. <laughs> so, what this project <laughs> is going to do is it's going to rebuild a failing section of 45, um, Interstate 45, and some, another highway in North Houston, uh, reroute it slightly, widen it, and tear down thousands of predominantly. Um, communities of color and businesses of color in the process, res- residences and businesses. And it has been like slammed by pretty much every progressive group in the Houston area, but it's being sort of rammed through by Texas. And to their credit, some incredible advocates uh, filed a lawsuit under like a civil rights grounds against this project. They got it stalled for the better part of two years, but just in the last couple of months, um, FHWA reached an agreement with them that allowed them to resume the project and mm. some minor concessions, most of which like advocates are like, they're not really going to change the nature of what they originally wanted to do. They slowed it down yeah. a little bit, right. but they weren't going to break ground on this project until after like the world cup anyway. So like the net result is the same. Yeah. The question that groups in my space are asking is like, okay, so who's to blame for that? Is it FHWA for blinking? Um, most people are saying probably not. They probably are kind of forced to until we can change the fundamental structure Mm -hmm. of our transportation reauthorization until we have not just a culture change, but a legal change um, that says that we need to, we can't continue to build highways that displace people that result in like net increases to pollution in an era of accelerating climate change um, until we like actually measure access in addition to congestion impacts mm-hmm. and things like that, it's not going to change. Like there, we have a pretty good secretary in a lot of ways who's pretty hamstrung in this regard. And we might slow things down and advocates can fight like hell. But if you have a program that basically says states can do whatever they want, states are going to do whatever they want. And it's a mm-hmm. huge bummer, but you know, next reauthorization is never that far away, fortunately. Yeah. So we have our time to rally the troops, I guess. And I, I know Jess is going to ask you a quick question in just a second, but I give you a hot scoop for an article if you want it just this week in our state. I mean, I testified flat out uh, our Senate, our state Senate Transportation Committee voted to move a bill to the floor for full vote. And it essentially it completely dictates to the locals that they cannot spend money on anything except for they call them highway projects and bridges Mm -hmm. which is translation obviously for capacity things and their claim was well if there's there's if there's less money or if there's money at the end then definitely well yeah because there's always money left at the end right so (laughs) jess oh i'm just saying i mean this whole conversation and i have said this i said this a little bit in my career it's not it's not really about money Wait, there's a, there's plenty of money yeah, out there. Yeah, we've never had a funding shortfall in this country. I hate no. that. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's like, yeah, when they're talking about we don't have enough money to do the right thing in our transportation systems, I just think it's, I, I just, I think we're spending money on the wrong things, right? And so the the other thing that's that's really interesting, and we were talking about um, safety of vehicles and how vehicles are getting bigger and things, and um, I and I even I always 
I almost don't want to ask this question. I'm going to ask it anyway, though. So with uh, connected and autonomous vehicles and this whole, you know, really push it, oh, this is going to be safer. It's going to talk to other people in the car. But what I'm, what I keep seeing is, is we're still, we're still focusing on the safety of the, the, the vehicle occupants, which is very important. Um, and then there is some, you know, safety of, of the occupants outside the vehicle, including other vehicles, but it, the kid, do you see, do you see that being even moved forward and, and helping the pedestrian um, injury and death problem in the U.S.? Autonomous vehicle technology generally. Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah, this is I don't really, know. yeah, no, it's a really hot topic and it's a big part of what I'm covering lately. Um, and there's lots of questions boiled into it, but basically again, streets blog is covering the movement to end car dependency, whether those cars are yeah. zero emission from cradle to grave, which no electric cars are by the by, um, whether right. they are perfectly <laughs> autonomous vehicles, uh, which, by the way, those don't exist yet. Um, <laughs> oh, Elon! Elon would like to have a word with you on that. Oh, <laughs> Let's <that's> call him. <laughs> if he had a communications department, I would, but <laughs> no, he doesn't. Um, them all. <laughs> Self purpose. I, I just say whatever I my advocates say about him because he does not provide a anyway. Um, separate rant. Um, but even if like cars were electric, autonomous. Um, if like all of these negative externalities were magically designed out and through this like techno utopic approach, we would still have a car dependent society. There would still be negative externalities for people who can't drive, <laughs> like folks who are blind, folks with mobility right. limiting disabilities yeah. that preclude driving, which by the way is about 40% of people with exactly challenges, people who don't want to drive, people who would like to live in a connected community where they see people on the street and can like interface with them. There are massive consequences of car dependency, even when the car itself is perfected completely. Then there's also the, all these separate questions about automation complacency. What happens when your imperfect vehicle, because again, there is no such thing as a real autonomous car yet, maybe ever. I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, when it fails, are you watching the voice on your phone as the person who killed Elaine Hertzberg in uh, yeah. Arizona did, the first pedestrian killed by the driver of a semi-autonomous car? Um, or are you paying attention to your eyes on the road? There's all these questions and externalities. Like I, I just did a report on um, a write-up of a report from an awesome researcher named Nico Larco out of U Oregon. Um, like, well, Okay, let's say like every autonomous car is shared. It's a taxi. We all give up our personal vehicles. You would need to find a use case that's going to replace trips from the suburbs to the city if you want to eliminate parking. <laughs> you know, like there's because the only people who are parking in downtown San Francisco, downtown New York, are people who are from commuting from way out in the suburbs. Can you convince them at the same time? There's cultural questions around autonomous vehicles that I think we aren't prepared to answer. And we're sort of using them as a solution in search of a problem when really the solutions that we have to traffic violence, uh, climate change, all the negative externalities of driving we've had since before the car existed. <laughs> That's what we need to return to in many cases. So, and I let's not forget the economic, the environmental impact of, you know, building a highway, maintaining a highway, snow totally. removal on a highway, all these other things. Uh, and, and it certainly, electric vehicles aren't going to change a 20-year traffic modeling process that tries to justify all of that too. So I know we could go on for hours on, on this, and this has been awesome, Kia. You guys at Streets Blog do a lot of other cool things, you know, the best and worst bus stops and things like that. What's what's on the horizon for Streets Blog from looking beyond just the here and now of, of the news cycle? Yeah, I mean, honestly, our special projects are not really big on our pipeline right now because we are kind of behind the scenes working on a site redesign. Um, so again, we were named Streets Blog back in 2006. Our site <laughs> looks pretty similar to what I looked in 2006. Um, so we're we're trying to do some sort of boring but important internal infrastructure updates right now uh, to make it look a little bit different, make it a little bit more accessible, a little so bit. So you're trying to maintain your infrastructure. Uh -huh. We're amazing We're concept, right? it first. It first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It first. Um, 
I mean, we are doing some expansion in the sense of like, I'm trying to work with more freelancers these days. So Streets Blog USA, again, I'm the only staff writer on Streets Blog USA. Um, I'm syndicating work from all over the country, from the Streets Blog affiliates, but they are not my employees. They are my colleagues and my equals. Um, and then I work with an awesome editor out of Streets Blog New York, who is also the editor of Streets Blog New York, Gersh Kunstman. So I'm pretty reliant on getting fresh voices in the door through the freelancer process. And that is hard to do when you're writing four articles a week. So oh, I'm yeah. just sort of quietly building those relationships and getting really exciting people uh, to work with us. Like George Jordan, who worked for Greater Greater Washington for a long time, just started yeah. freelancing for us a little bit. And I'm really excited to work with him more. Um, re- working with a really great writer out of Texas named Amal Ahmed, who I thought was fantastic. I'm, I'm constantly trying to kind of grow our network and just get to know new corners of this conversation. Cause when you write about this stuff, as much as I do, you always need to find new angles on this topic yeah, and play totally. there in it, um, but it takes time. So hint, hint for any freelancers out there in our listenership, yeah, no kidding. Uh, call up Kia. All right. This has been awesome. Chris, let's go to the lightning round. Well, thank you, Kia. We appreciate your input and certainly the efforts of streets blog. I know we've all been a fan uh, for years and years, it's definitely one of those go-to sources. And I hope that for our audience, if it hasn't been for you, go to it because holy cow, you're going to learn a lot and, you know, all across the country. And like you said, not just the national USA site, but the individual community sites as well. And so we appreciate your time. So let's turn our attention to the lightning round. Stupid questions, lots of fun, but uh, we're going to pepper you with some. I'll, I'll hit you with a couple first. I believe you're a Midwest person, right? You yeah. kind of born and raised. All right. Yeah. So my first question, Chicago style pizza. Is it pizza or is it casserole? Okay. First of all, this is a controversial question because what is <laughs> Chicago know it style is. pizza? <laughs> There's a big debate going on in St. Louis right now because the New York Times ran this article that said Chicago style thin crust pizza, which is St. Louis style pizza. Let the record ah, state. Yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah, I I think it is not a dishonorable thing to call it a casserole. I love a casserole. I'm from the Midwest. So sure, it's both. (laughs) It could be both. Okay. So So is that St. Louis style pizza, the type that's cut in squares instead of wedges? Mm -hmm. Is that, did that come from St. Louis? That's Detroit, right? Well, oh, okay. Listen, (laughs) I have strong pizza opinions about the Midwest pizza, but St. Louis style pizza, honestly, is a little bit of an abomination of nature, but I still play because I'm a Midwesterner and that's what we do about things that we made. Um, It is a thin crust pizza, again, cut, you're you're right, cut into squares rather than wedges. Um, It has what's called Prevel cheese, which is like Mm a salty agglomeration of like cream cheese and like, like floor paste. It's nasty, but it's, it's fine. (laughs) I like Um, it. (laughs) Wow. Mozzarella is involved. Um, yeah. Detroit pizza, I think of as more of a a deep dish jet style pizza, but there you go. So you're a self-proclaimed storyteller. And a couple of movies that come to my mind that have storytelling as pretty major themes, which would you go with a Christmas story or Goodfellas? Oh, I got to say Christmas story. Cause I'm, I grew up in Cleveland where the Christmas story oh, house nice. is and we take a little pilgrimage there whenever you had relatives in town. So is the yeah. leg lamp still in the window or it got yeah. broken for real? <laughs> I mean, oh, it's, I, it's, it's not the original, I don't think, but yeah, you got it. <laughs> well, all we know it was for Jilly and that's Italian. So <laughs> That's okay, right. so I want to know, you're a podcaster, uh, what's your favorite microphone? Oh, I don't know. What am I using? I I was bought this by a previous employer and I don't, I, this is a no don't comment <laughs> question. I have no idea. <laughs> we, we have this constant conversation where we're just like, which one's the good microphone? Which one's not the good microphone? It's horrible. Okay. So my second question for you, a little bit different spin. Um, you're talking about how you guys go around and, and, and work on the, you know, you water the trees you had put in and stuff. So when you're traveling to another city, what's the nerdiest like streets bloggy kind of thing that you all do when you travel somewhere else. What's the nerd thing that you're doing? We're total nerd travelers. We take pictures of weird signs. I was yeah. in, I was in hot de- like desert hot hot springs, and there was a sign that was like speed limit, and it was like spa zone. I was like, this is amazing. I'm never in any of my travel pictures. Just like pictures of other stuff, yeah. and I'm like, why don't we have these in our neighborhoods? <laughs> no, I'm I'm definitely the same way. I mean. Gosh. So I went on a trip to um, Bogota, Colombia and Medellin, Colombia recently, and I loved it. It was amazing. Um, And I took a photo on that trip of a crosswalk uh, signal that was 
I think like 65 seconds. It was like some like colossal Whoa. huge number. Oh my gosh. I caught all it like 35 seconds into it and I was just like, <laughs> stop. And like all my friends were like, we're going to a bar. And I'm like, no, we're taking a photo of this. So, no, yeah. we're taking a nap at this intersection for 60 <laughs> seconds. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would make like... Yeah, that would make like copies of MUTCD yeah. start trembling just from oh, energy. Oh my Can you it. imagine? So, it was like a four lane car. road too. It wasn't oh that. It wasn't like huge. And like meanwhile, I have like a five lane road two blocks from my house that gives you a grand total of seventeen seconds to get across it. So hustle. What's uh, <laughs> I wept a little. I must say. Well, speaking of travel, what's your favorite night spot in Branson, Missouri? I've never been. I don't oh. know. I'm sorry. I heard they have like a musical, biblical, spectacular thing oh, happening. Wow. Like, uh, <laughs> that's what it is, right? Oh, it's man. like I had a, a I'm, I'm showing who... my my Jewish right now. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> we like it. <laughs> I had a friend that went to University of Kansas who did their uh, master's thesis on the water flow rates in Branson, Missouri, because apparently at 6:30 a.m. when all the old people wake up they have a serious problems providing the necessary amount of water pressure. Wow. You know, in St. Louis, we have um, these old style water towers, like not like a water tower with a bulb to hold water, but actually to modulate water pressure. It's like more like a sphere and we Mm -hmm. have, or I'm a, sorry, a cylinder. A cylinder. We know what you mean. (laughs) Yeah. Sorry. I'm like doing a hand gesture, but this will not be seen by anyone um yeah we we have them to moderate this problem from all over uh we're like have like i think three of like the remaining six in america so there's your fun urban planning fact <laughs> cool. i was keep waiting for chris to see if there's a georgia frontier statue oh uh, no burn it burn it destroy <laughs> that no all right you spent time down in albuquerque or not albuquerque uh new mexico in santa fe right but yeah. albuquerque not too far i know in Idaho we still celebrate you know napoleon dynamite for crying out loud it's still a thing so i gotta ask you if you had to save one who are you saving walter white or jesse oh jesse jesse <laughs> that's a clear, he's a, a, clear he's a boise guy so they're they're uh, here this week slinging their uh their new tequila so he's l- like a hundred percent less evil so yes jesse. <laughs> well he's my a, new mexico Jane question is the answer but jesse what would work too <laughs> so. my go. new mexico question was red green or christmas style christmas christmas oh, yeah there you go. that's an easy one yeah uh, you, i, I would be for you Good. So I'm going to ask you this: Who's a pop star's pop music star's voice who torments people in hell? Oh my God! What? <laughs> <laughs> um, she, I don't listen to a lot of pop music, so that's tough anybody in that in all of music that you just hear and you cringe and go, oh. Why? Oh, Why? Like and everything that? was pop at some point. So let's just remember popular. True. True. <laughs> Boy. Boy. Nothing coming to mind. Rick Astley you... kind of had his day and then, you know, Millie Vanilli was. I like think that. because I am an appreciator of low culture, it's hard for me to be like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, let's like throw <laughs> Millie Vanilli out the window, you know, like they had their thing. <laughs> like, that's great. You probably um, like a Brutus originals. architecture right now. She's one of those sympathizers. <laughs> <laughs> they had more musical hits than all of us combined so you know, exactly. weird. i can't denigrate it that much i'm not a hater so this is hard i'm not a hater uh how what? much of a rival is there between like kansas city and st louis style ribs let's see i'm we're we're talking about a lot yeah, of it's food. lunchtime it's food yeah that's true i know i know um also the thing i eat a lot of so hard to say um from what i have gathered kansas city is like the the out and out winner um because that's like where all the like really old pit master like dynasties are um i've only been to kansas city like one time in my entire life so i am wow. not an authority on this i know i live my life in a very like seven mile biking radius of my house. I was going to say, do you live in your own 15 minute city over there? Pretty much. (laughs) Um, I'm like either flying to another country or I'm like walking 20 minutes, like to my grocery store. Like nothing in between. That's very little in between. Yeah. Um, So like, don't even ask me about like St. Louis suburbs because I'm like, I don't know. (laughs) I've lived here for 13 (laughs) years. I have no idea what's out there. Um, It's so bad. I know. But um, yeah, the, the ribs are good in, in both. I, I know there's some controversy over like the sweet versus vinegar of it all, but yeah. I could, God. please don't make me say on tape, which one, which well, I guess it's, which, it's I don't always, know. 
<laughs> it's always one up because Kansas City yeah. uses St. Louis style pork ribs. So oh, they, good they can't grief. get away from that. Teaching me new things about yeah, meat. <laughs> this is almost worse than talking about sports teams, y'all. This is this is getting bad. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be much All help right. there either. So. I'm just saying. Last great book you read. That's what I want to know. Okay, that one I'm good on. I read a lot. So that's like my number one yeah. hobby. Um, <laughs> last great book I read. That's a good question. I'm like, how much of my dark side do I want to show people? So I think- All of it. <laughs> Yeah, All like I, <laughs> I've mentioned in passing that I'm a writer. I wrote a novel that came out in 2016 Ooh. that was a horror novel. So uh, the last book I read was a really interesting horror novel um, that's really, really dark and not for the faint of heart. Big trigger warning, every possible trigger warning on it. It's called Tender is the Flesh um, by an uh, Argentinian writer named Augustina. I think Basterica is how you pronounce her last name. I might be wrong about that's that. Beautiful. but. It is about like a dystopian world where a virus has infected all animals and human beings can now legally be consumed for meat. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, that's in, like amazing. an industrial farming kind of way. And it is like real dark, real bleak. I'm reading it for book club because those are the kind of friends I have. It's analogous to the vehicles and pedestrian side of I mean, look, like, yeah. that's what I like to say. Like, I, I live kind of a double life. I write fiction for a couple hours before I go and write nonfiction for my day job. But like, I think both fundamentally are about like, I'm interested in questions about power and violence and yeah. those seep into everything that I do. It seems Great. like so. so. So back to the basics, how do you feel about the Game of Thrones whole book series? I mean, that is power and violence. Oh, yeah. Very, well, George R. R. Martin is very important to the civic life in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He's like funded a ton of their, I don't know if no you way. Don't know this. I didn't know this. Tell me. Because well, I'm you angry at him for not finishing that freaking series. So well, it's because he's too good. busy making Santa Fe, New Mexico, a better place to live. Um, oh, yeah, he's been okay. like funding all these like this. arts collectives to do some really interesting things. They uh, He bought a group called Meow Wolf, if you have heard of it, um, a bowling alley. I was and they just turned... at Meow Wolf in Denver two weeks yeah. ago. Yeah, kidding. Exactly. Yeah, they've now like franchised out into like a hipster Disneyland for every city. It's incredible, but it's okay. just like immersive <laughs> art experience. And then they go out in the community and make all kinds of incredible public art. Um, he bought a train that is like Stop. being used. I'm serious. Um, for like immersive art experiences on a train, like it's a cool city. I would love to move back to New Mexico someday and save Jesse. So apparently. <laughs> well, and I think your your book it was at so Soylent Green was that same premise where you know environmental disaster, what have you, and people were eating each other in a compact bar at the end they realized oh god so yeah. yeah what's old is new again i guess but on that cheery note yeah <laughs> we're gonna call this an episode kia wilson senior editor with streets blog usa please go to their website man it, it really is and i know for all of us it truly it has been a source of lots of good information and great work by kia and a lot of others so we appreciate your time on the planning commission podcast today thank you so much for having me i had a lot of fun Great. Okay. So to our listeners, reminder, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. Go to our website too while you're at it. Subscribe, like, go to our YouTube page, Amazon, Apple, Spotify, all the different ways. Send us an email, reach out, give us some feedback. We love it. We maybe make a future episode about it. Commissioners, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. I am hungry. Second. I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. With that, this episode coming to an end, taking it to the streets with Kia Wilson. See you all the next time. Appreciate it. Have a good day. Hey, everybody. Commissioner Danley here. Would you like to see more? Hear more? Well, we got you covered. Go to our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. It's got everything you want. Guests, yep, past episodes, the video, the audio, even our whiskey pairing, links to everything about all the people we've had on, books, websites, you name it. It's unbelievable. If you want to reach out to us, please, we'd be more than happy to chat. You can email us, planningcommissionpodcast at gmail.com. If you want to tweet at us, go for it, at planningcommish. We're also on YouTube with the Planning Commission Podcast channel, Facebook. Heck, send us a carrier pigeon if you need to. We'd love to hear from you about ideas guests you name it thank you for listening we appreciate it we'll keep doing our thing you keep doing yours have a good one